Hello, everybody. In this episode, I'll be speaking with Stuart Armstrong. Stuart was previously a senior researcher at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford, where he worked on AI safety and X risk, as well as how to spread between galaxies by disassembling the planet Mercury. He is currently the head boffin at Aligned AI, where he works on concept extrapolation, the subject of our discussion. For links to what we're discussing, you can check the description of this episode, and you can read the transcript at axrp.net. Well, Stuart, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's, cool. Uh, good to be on. Yeah, it's nice to have you. So I guess the thing I want to be talking about today is your work on, or your, your thoughts on concept extrapolation and model splintering, which I guess you've called it. Can you just tell us what is concept extrapolation? Model splintering is when the features or the concepts on which you built uh, your goals or your reward functions break down. Traditional examples are in physics, when, instance, e the ether disappeared. Mm. Um, it didn't mean when the ether disappeared that all the previous physics that had been based on ether suddenly became completely wrong. Okay. You had to extend the old results into uh, a new framework. You had to find a new framework, and you had to extend it in that way. So model splintering is when the model falls apart or the uh, features of concept fall apart, and concept extrapolation is what you do to extend the concept across that divide. Okay. Like there was a concept of energy before relativity, and there's a concept of energy after relativity. They're not exactly the same thing, but they are, there's a definite continuity to it. Cool. And can you give us an example of... So you mentioned like, uh, you know, at some point we used to think there was an ether and now we think there isn't. What's an example of a concept or something that splintered when like we realized there wasn't an ether anymore, just to get a really concrete example? Um, Maxwell's equations, Maxwell's non-relativistic equations are based on a non-constant speed of light or that Maxwell's equations are not relativistic though they have a relativistic formulation they, and hang on, I thought I thought they were I'm, isn't that why hmm. you get the constant speed of light out of them okay if that's uncertain then uh, let's uh, try uh, another example um, we could do um, energy okay. Once you learn energy, general relativity or energy, uh, inertial mass, uh, for example, those uh, concepts need a Newtonian or needed a Newtonian universe uh, to make sense. And okay. when it wasn't so much the absence of ether that it was the surprisingly constant speed of light hmm. that broke those. So when you measure the speed of light to be the same no matter what your own movement and acceleration is this breaks a lot of the newtonian concept okay and is the idea that there were like potentially many ways you could have um generalized them or reformed them to work in a relativistic universe uh no not really okay there this is part of the interesting thing about concept extrapolation is that sometimes there's only one real inheritor of the old concept hmm. and sometimes there can be multiple uh, ones like temperature our modern concept of temperature as the derivative of energy with respect to entropy for example is one of the direct descendants of, well, it feels hot today mm. or, uh, versus it feels cold today. But um, our neuroscience qualia, how we feel things, is another direct descendant of that old concept. Okay. Physics might lead us a bit astray because extrapolations tend to be clear and definite and only one though maybe that might be because of the choice that we've made. There might have been multiple ones that were 
discarded along the way. But in general, it's sometimes there's a clear extrapolation. Sometimes there are multiple routes you can go down, and sometimes there's a mix between the two. Okay. And should I think of concept extrapolation, like, is this the kind of thing that you do when, like, you learn something new about, like, the way the world works? Or, like, like, am I also going to talk about it in the case where I just, like, you know, go to a new place that I haven't been before, and, like, things are slightly different there, but, like, it's not like the laws of different... It's not like the laws of physics are fundamentally different or anything. All of these are on a continuum. Okay. Um, if you look at how we've tried to define model splintering, there's the smallest of of changes uh, or can be captured in the formalism, or the you you basically have ontology changes at one end, and you have is a car that is painted a new color. Uh, still a car uh, at the other end. Okay. And I guess the idea is that you're going to try to think about all of these with like one framework? Yes. Okay. And the car that is painted of a slightly different color is a, an example of one where there's a trivial uh, single extrapolation. Mm. Yes, it's a car. It's uh, where, uh, uh, and the ontology changes or extreme ontology changes can be ones where it's really not clear what to do. Okay. So now that I think we've got a good sense of what concept extrapolation is, how do you see it as relating to AI alignment or like preventing doom from AI? In a sense, I see it as the 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 very center of it. Uh, Nate has recently published something about the left turn or the unexpected left turn. Uh, I believe he's formulated it. The idea being that at some point it'll become uh, much easier to generalize mm. capabilities than to generalize uh, morals, uh, not morals, um, a lot, uh, values, yep. goals, those kind of objects. And the one way of thinking of capability increases is this is a changing and presumably an improvement of your world model. So you get a better ability to influence the world as your model of it changes, as you understand different approaches and that hmm. uh, sort of thing. Then if you just change the models there and have your naively defined uh, goals will have your goals naively defined in the way they were originally defined, then this is going to go hideously wrong. But if the goals change as the world model changes, then you're nat uh, naturally, well, not naturally, artificially solving part of the alignment problem. Uh, an example that I had was the a sort of toy model of wire heading, where you had images of smiling people and non-smiling people, and the smiling people had a big happy written on the image, and the non-smiling ones had sad hmm. written on the image. And when the AI had the ability to change the text, it was its reward was initially defined on the on the images which were given the label of happy or sad. Hmm. And then it developed the ability to change the text on images that it was producing in whatever way. And this led to non-smiling images with happy written on them and the opposite. So this is model splintering. It has now encountered a bigger its model of the world pre previously was that the expression and the text were perfectly correlated so there was no real need to distinguish between the two now its model of the world has changed and it can see that these features are no longer correlated they can be uh, different and we've published a benchmark recently and what the benchmark is essentially is 
w upon reali realizing that the model has splintered, that the correlated features are no longer correlated, it generates multiple candidates for what its reward information could extrapolate to. Okay. So in a sense, it has gained capabilities or, or knowledge about the world. Either way, either way is a good way of modeling what's happened. And now, as a consequence, it must extrapolate its reward or generate different candidates to deal with its increase in power or its increase in its world model. Okay. So I, I guess the idea is that presumably we'd have to be able to get two models out of that because it's, it's like not obvious whether we want to be categorizing things based on the smiley faces or based on the red text at the bottom of the screen, right? Yes. The fact that it's only two models is a human judgment of what features are important. Okay. And there's actually a rather interesting philosophical computer science insight that has emerged from looking at this. This is, can I try a, a very simple example? Yep. Hit us. You may, ha this is the a double MNIST, one of the simplest possible classification tasks imaginable. Mm. You have a zero on top of another zero. That is labeled zero. Okay. And you have a one on top of another one, and that is labeled one. And humans instinctively see that there are two features here. Yeah. The digit on top and the digit on the bottom. However, when you zoom into these images, there's actually hundreds of features. Mm. There's the upper left curve of the zero, the upper right curve of the zero. Every piece of every digit is its own feature that can be used quite successfully as the feature on which you do the classification task. Mm. So intrinsically, this data has many, many different features and many, many different extrapolations. But the ones that you consider or that it is useful to consider depend on how the world model of the AI changes or and on the data that it sees. If it sees 0, 1, and 1, 0, if it sees a lot of those, then the two useful features are, OK, it is the top digit versus bottom digit. That is as expected. But if it sees things where you get the left half of the top digit and the right half, and those are changed, and that, if that kind of thing happens, then there you would hone in on different features. So what this means is that the world model or the unlabeled data in this case play the role of telling you which are the possible extrapolations, what, what breaks, what, what are the features that break apart, and what are the features that don't break apart? Mm. Okay. And again, this seem yeah. So... Uh, feel free to cut that whole thing out if it's too technical. But... No, no, no. Um... And I just wanted to say that we have been starting with... We, I just wanted to say that we started with image classification not because image classification is particularly relevant to this task, but because we had got to the point where the theory seemed sufficiently done that we needed to get some practical experience and practical results on what extrapolation is and how it can work uh, to feed back into the theory ultimately. So that uh, bit that I told you about how the unlabeled data or the world model can determine which are the features that come apart hmm. and which are the ones that don't. This is an insight that is constructed from the practical experience of doing uh, the image classification task. 
uh, we're aiming to extend it to RL and other environments uh, at the moment as well. But yes, the practical and theoretical benefits of sitting down to do this seem to have been borne out, at least are starting to bear fruit. Okay. And can you give us a sense of like, what is this, the the theory that's been developed here? So first of all, like what, what does the theory like tell you? It tells you how to accomplish the task of extrapolating beyond the training data as your world model changes and how this might be done in a human safe way. Okay. It's in essence, the core of the alignment problem in our view is always going to be some version of concept extrapolation in that what we are trying to do is do a safe, survivable, flourishing world via AI. And none of those concepts are defined with any degree of rigor across the potential futures that we encounter. So how these can be extrapolated is going to be a critical part of it. We, If we want flourishing, we have to define what flourishing is and get that definition to extend at least adequately across all possible weird futures that the AI could put us in. So there is, in a sense, in a sense, there's no theory that says that this is doable and there's no theory that says that it has to fail. Hmm. What we are as humans is we exist in a variety of environments, uh, both real and imagined, and we have pieces of values and preferences defined across these environments. And it is not surprising that, say, there's huge contradictions between the different parts of our values when we try to formalize them or extend them. But you can extend a lot of human values in relatively decent ways, more or less complicated, depending on your preferences. So it's not like there is a true essence of human value out there that we are trying to get to. If there was, then in a sense, concept extrapolation has to succeed or some alignment method has to succeed. In theory, it's just a question of reaching that goal. So it might may fail in practice. Mm. But since there isn't that, we can't say that alignment has to work in theory. But similarly, we can't say that alignment has to fail in theory. It's because Yes, uh, you might make the argument if there is this ideal thing out there that if we can't reach it, then it has to fail. But since there isn't that, it doesn't have to fail. And we've seen examples of concept extrapolation in physics, in morality, that can be more or less good, but are, tend to be non-disastrous. One of my uh, sort of favorite examples of that is how you can go from the sentiments expressed when uh, it was written, we hold it self-evident that all men are created equal and get to the suffragettes movements and votes for women. Mm. It seems to be a slight contradiction or huge contradiction between what was written, what was intended, and the ultimate goal. But there is a relatively straight line that you can follow through history and morality that goes from one to the other. So that seems to be a successful extrapolation of uh, a concept of a moral value to a new environment. So it can be done in practice and it can fail in practice. We also have examples of that. So this seems to mean that 
we need a lot more experience as to how these things succeed and fail in practice. Okay. So, yeah, so I, I guess part part of what you're saying there is just like uh, related to the fact that to some degree this is inevitable and like the, the thing you're aligning to, I guess, is also concepts that don't obviously, that don't have a super clear extrapolation. I guess I'm wondering, like, you, you mentioned some idea of a theory of concept extrapolation. Like, like what are the relevant objects in this theory? And, like, what's... Yeah, can, can you give us a sense for, like, what the, what the results are in this theory or, like, you know, what the relevant properties are of things such that if you have this property, then you can extrapolate well or poorly or something? Let me give you an example. Okay. Right. It is my strong belief that um, symbol grounding can be solved in part by concept extrapolation. An example that I give for this is imagine if you had an AI trained on videos of happy people and maybe ne the negative videos of sad people with uh, lower reward. Mm. Now, the standard alignment failure mode here is that it fills the universe with videos of happy people. Hmm. The reason I am saying that symbol grounding may have a may be solvable by concept extrapolation hmm. is that even though the wire-headed ideal seem is the best explanation for what's going on uh, for the training data, the wire heading is always the best explanation for the training data because it fits perfectly hmm. the hypothesis of well there are actual humans out in the world they are sometimes sad and sometimes happy um, that correspond to these clusters of something or other reactions hormones this is not a theory that is all that complicated to consider if you have a good world model. Hmm. So just having a practical model of the world would suggest that the symbol grounded version of these are not too hard to find. They're below the wire headed one in say probability hmm. or simplicity or fit, but they're not, it's not random. Fitting this data to actual humans being happy is a lot easier than fitting this data to stock prices or uh, the movements of the moons of Jupiter and uh, things of that nature. So this is, and, and I'm set. This is my strong belief at the moment. I have not proven this result. Okay, but this is the kind of thing that would be very valuable to have a, a formulation of a, uh, a results uh, both theoretical and experimental and it would make the alignment problem harder or easier depending on what uh, the result is sure because in one view at least if we don't change the world too much you have the wire heading solution and you can actually rule that out relatively easily. And the next strongest candidate is something that corresponds pretty much to what we want. And this would allow us to define humans, say, uh, humans and humans happiness by here's some humans, this is what happiness looks like, rather than constructing very, very complicated definitions of what these are. Hmm. There's essentially a trade-off that the easier concept extrapolation, the, if concept extrapolation works fantastically to a level that I don't expect that hmm. it will, you can kind of get good outcomes by just pointing vaguely at good outcomes in the world now. However, it if it doesn't work quite as well as that, you need to put more training data into it. 
But in any case, the ultimate aim is that you do it without having perfect training data because you will never have perfect training data. Okay. So so I guess that's the aim. And there's some sense that like you can probably prove things based on like like based on which theories of the world like make more sense or easier to handle or something. I guess part of what I'm wondering is like is there are there existing results or theoretical constructs yet? Or is this like a work in progress? Um there are theoretical constructs as in my first attempt at the mathematical formulation of model splintering, okay. which uh, I imported into category theory, which was quite interesting mathematically. Now, the problem with it is that it is sufficiently universal that it is relatively easy to generate toy examples where concept extrapolation succeeds and ones where it fails. Hmm. the failure mainly being um, there are too many options and the consequences of bad decisions are too great that it just cannot be um, solved. But how, which of these, and the, the, easy, the easy ones are things closer to physics or um, this is a car of a different color kind of approaches where the basically if you want to do a model of the world where concept extrapolation is easy define fundamental reality with these concepts and then add approximations to it hmm. and then the extrapolation will be easy because the extrapolation is already there in a sense okay and it turns out that in physics, the extrapolations are already there in most cases. General relativity and energy being a potential exception. Okay. But um, so which, what is the description of our moral, our value concepts, our preferences? Because they're not, they're clearly not pieces of a single well-defined full human utility function. Um, so they ha it hasn't been built that way. But, but they are of a maximal complexity. The brain, take the complexity of the brain, take the complexity of all human brains. Mm. The estimates of every human being uh, on every potential realistic uh, short environment that they could encounter uh, that doesn't break their brain, the, the amount of information in that is finite. And can that be extended in a safe way to extreme capabilities and extreme new environments? Uh, I think it can. Mm. But how easy is it, how hard it is, this is far more an experimental question than it is a theoretical one. I I feel okay. So would a summary of that be like there's some theoretical, there, there's some formalism, but like it's not, it's not expressive enough to, or, or like the real gains are in just like trying things and seeing what happens, um, or like checking how how reality actually is. It's testing how reality actually is. It's also testing how the tools that we use might interact with that reality there are ways like when you start extrapolating there are choices that you can make you can you can rely heavily on human feedback you can try and idealize human feedback along the lines of what humans themselves would consider idealization you can uh, rule out wireheading solutions and try and give a syntactic definition of what wireheading consists of. You can use the sort of modal solution at each point, uh, in a sense. So that's more sort of self directed and simplicity uh, based. 
you can try sort of low level human values and extrapolate them and then try and fit them within say human meta preferences or you can try the meta preferences first and extend the low level preferences to meet them up i'm mentioning all of these because we don't really know which ones will be better okay and some of them may break immediately some of them may lead to theorems as to the conditions under which they break or don't break. Okay. And that would be very useful to have. So in that case, so you mentioned some kind of formalism that um, was maybe connected to category theory where you could come up with these counter examples and counter examples. Can you give us a flavor of like what that is so that we can get a sense of concretely like what's going on? Okay. Bear in mind that I am not sure that this formalism is the ideal one. Okay. It may be too general. It has some universality properties, but universality properties in maths are cheap and easy. Hmm. But, okay, the basic idea is that you start with your features and you have probability distributions over the possible values that the features can take. And this defines your world model. Okay. And for example, you could have the feature of pressure and temperature and volume and the laws of um, the gas the ideal gas laws would be would give you a distribution of how these are related okay then you might move to a different model of say atoms bouncing around okay and then you can maybe in in this case you can at least statistically port the ideal gas laws um, if you cross but maybe actually there are different types of atoms in your new model and that means that the ideal gas laws are no longer uh, I, accurate you have the uh, say the van der Waal gas laws hmm. so you relate this is this this is the my description of the universe according to this features this is my probability distribution uh, and this is my translation of this set of features to this set of features and then there is a comparison between what the probability distributions are saying okay so if you just have one type of atom, you can take you can get the ideal gas laws as a statistical uh, version of the deterministic atoms bouncing around model. Mm. If you have different types of atoms, then the two distributions may or may not correspond exactly, depending on how the different types of atoms, where they're located, and how how you analyze them. I think I'm, I'm rambling there. Uh, let's uh, take that. Yeah, so w when you translate between ideal gas laws and atoms bouncing around, hmm. you can check whether your say your more advanced one, the atoms bouncing around, does the probability distribution there give you exactly the, the probability distribution from the gas laws, the ideal gas laws? In that case, this is just a pure improvement. You've refined your understanding of what's going on. Hmm. But what will generally happen is that it's slightly different. You've not only refined your understanding, but you found errors in your previous uh, understanding. And 
so the category theory comes in when you move from one uh, universe of potential features to another universe of potential features. Okay. And you can port the probability distributions back and forth. And then you can compare what they look like on the other universe. And if they correspond perfectly, that means you've just you've done a pure refinement. Uh, you've you've you're either gaining knowledge in one direction, or you're statistically grouping them together uh, in the other direction. Hmm. And that forms a category. But there are weaker correspondences where you can learn or approximate or the things don't quite match up that say correspond more to how you went from uh, newtonian physics to uh, relativity so but there is a you can have a distance metric for how well they correspond or how well they correspond in typical environments Mm. so this is a formalism with which you can discuss how model splintering uh, works. I am not yet sure whether it is a, a useful one. Okay. It's. I did it so that I knew that there was something, a theoretical construct out there that everything could be formulated in terms of if I needed to, that I wasn't, I wasn't sort of going in an area where the the objects fundamentally didn't speak to each other or were of a completely different nature. That so I I now I don't have to fear any ontology change because any ontology change, including some of the weirdest ones you can do, can be formulated in this in this formalism. But as I say, whether it is useful uh except as a thinking tool i i don't know okay this is going to be something that will be determined more experimentally okay so when we're thinking about concept extrapolation yeah do you have a sense of what it looks like when there's like only one way for a concept to extrapolate like is there something you can say about what has to be true for there to be essentially a unique or maybe just a preferred extrapolation? The the easiest ways, as I said, to get that is to start with your ultimate concept and have the, uh, the lower level or the messy ones as just approximations of that ideal one. Hmm. And that, 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 that is physics, uh, basically, where... Um, it turns out that the underlying model of reality is surprisingly simple. It could have not turned out that way, in which case the extrapolation across concepts would have been more complicated. I mean, we could go back to the ancient Greeks and the conception of the four elements or five elements Hmm. um, and how they determined the physics of the time, that there is no real extrapolation of what is air and fire Hmm. from that era to nowadays. It's all sort of air is something that goes up and is moist, or is it dry? It doesn't really make much sense. But the predictions you could make from that, that if you tossed a rock into uh, a pond, it would fall, hmm. that, that extrapolated. Yeah. And I so, still talk about like air and fire, you know, it's not like those concepts have gone away. I think we would agree about, for the most part, about what stuff I run into in my everyday is air and what stuff is water. Maybe. I mean, what about Earth? And if you are yeah. in another planet, is that air? I mean, or... I'm not, though. Yeah. You know? <laughs> okay. But, yeah. But we're having a discussion here about 
how these concepts they kind of yeah they do they do in some circumstances they do in don't do in others and yes so the challenge here is that we absolutely want the concepts to extrapolate well because they're we're using them as not just concepts but as our goals hmm. so we want it to do well and what is the definition of well which itself is a judgment based on our values which again it has to extrapolate itself so let's be a bit more practical hmm. human rights for example have turned out to be easily for the fundamental human rights have turned out to be relatively easily extendable or extrapolatable in the modern world because there is a relatively clear division between what's human and what's not where you get into ambiguous areas like um, fetuses and embryos that is where you get some of the biggest fighting on them mm. but if yeah, if there were sentient chimpanzee, well, chimpanzees are probably sentient. If there were increased intelligence chimpanzees that could cope in modern society, say, hmm. or had good language, and there was a large community of them, and that kind of thing, not not human, definitely distinct from human, possibly stupider in many ways, if you wanted to ensure that they were different but their existence would mean the definition of what is and wasn't isn't a human becomes a lot more complicated if no that's a bad example but a better example is what if the neanderthals were still around in large numbers hmm. that you had a differently intelligent humanoid species probably stupider in most ways would be my guess but maybe smarter in some ways and different and there the concept of human rights would become more complicated because maybe there are some things that we value that they don't value at all or vice versa especially maybe in the social arenas hmm. So a lot of the ease of extending the concept of human rights or the concept of legal equality has been practical, that it turns out that this makes sense, it can be defined, and then you might think, well, here are examples, Neanderthals, intelligent chimpanzees that undermine it, Maybe we can either draw the boundary large or we can say, let's not create or not allow the existence of these edge cases that would undermine the central principle. But I fear this is getting a bit away from your question. Legal equality is a very... It's a powerful concept that is a distillation of a lot of social urges and preferences across that humans have. We have innate equality feelings, but they are very, not necessarily incoherent, but they're very situational. They point in lots of different directions. You pick a story you can depending on how you present it you can make pretty much any type of behavior the one to be desired or avoided on grounds of equality or other similar sentiments hmm. however we have come up with this concept of legal equality and a lot of inequality uh, that is allowed within legal inequality so this gave us a distillation of a lot of our equality fairness 
values and left other ones aside. So this is a more or less successful distillation of something that has a lot of weird shards in human values if you zoom into it. Basically, what I'm saying is if you tossed away the concept of laws and legal equality hmm. and then looked into what would count as equality or fairness. So toss away the concept of legal equality, take the human urges towards equality and fairness and rebuild something from that. We may not find something that is all that close to what we uh, what we had initially. Okay. It may be that there is other concepts of equality that may have emerged and that may have been more that you can organize society around. But we have got to legal equality. It is a distillation of a lot of human values and a relatively low information one compared with the amount of information that human preferences to do with fairness have. Okay. So it is possible to extrapolate uh, very successfully from lots and lots of very incoherent things towards something that didn't, didn't exist before. It wasn't that there was a legal system and a concept of legal equality, and then we got pieces of that that were implanted into uh, tribal humans, and then we've just rebuilt the thing there. It is a construction, a generalization, an extrapolation, and one that is reasonably close to uh, its origins. Okay. And I guess this is an example of something where, like, there are potentially multiple different successful extrapolations. And if you want to extrapolate, you've just you sort of got to pick one and go with it. Um, not necessarily. One can always choose to become conservative across the different extrapolations. Okay. This is not unusual. This a, a useful practical feature of humans is that we tend to have diminishing returns. Hmm. This allows us to combine different preferences uh, in ways that might otherwise be impossible. So what is the value of the Mona Lisa in terms of human lives is an un undefined question. I would say that for people who have not sat down to figure it out, it is undefined, and it's there are multiple possible answers for them. Hmm. But most of those answers do not lead to uh, most of those human answers do not lead to a world without uh, art or to a world without uh, living humans in it. Okay. Cool. Getting back a bit to so so if i think about both that and the uh the happy face data set and challenge it seems like for both of them we're using this idea of concept extrapolation or model splintering how much yeah if, if i'm thinking like how valid like how much i want to invest in this in the concept of concept concept extrapolation so to speak it seems like one thing i'm going to want to know is like how universal a phenomenon, at least the, the relevant fixes might be. So if we're working on this like happy face data set, do you expect that like working on concept extrapolation in that setting is going to tell you much about, you know, extrapolating the concept of like legal equality, for example? And also do you think like for each application is it are there going to be like new things we need to think about in terms of how concepts extrapolate or like will we eventually just solve concept extrapolation for for all the cases of splintering we expect to run into we might this is a practical question uh rather than a theoretical one 
Mm. If I already knew the answer to it, um, we would have a, a decent theory uh, for how to go about it. Okay. There are already some insights that are gained from the even the very simplistic image classifier. The the example I gave you is of what role the world model or the unlabeled data is doing in disambiguating what the possible extrapolations are. Mm. Now, this is maybe not, you can connect it with philosophical work and computer science work that has already been done. Mm. But this was, to me, at least a, oh, yes, of course. But I'd never thought of it that way. Um, so it has already been a generator of insights. And the fact that we can do this using relatively dull um, gradient descent methods, we're getting around to writing up the method and publishing it. But the fact that we can do it using relatively uh, standard gradient descent methods means that it is possible to do this in the sort of standard computer science approach, which it wasn't clear that that would be the case at all. Okay, cool. I mean, I mean, I guess it seems like you must think that there's some degree of generalization for how to think about concept extrapolation. Otherwise, you wouldn't like form a word for it and work on this image thing when I, I gather your heart's desire is not actually to classify happy and sad uh, faces, right? Really? Oh, yes. Um, we started with that because it was easiest, sure. basically. Uh, we might have started on a coin run example. That was another one that we considered. Uh, though I, we think that the methods here can be used for the coin run example. The coin run, to explain, was a very simple Mario-ish platform game mm. in which an agent would to bounce around and then find the coin all the way on the um, right. And that would be the victory condition. And if you trained agents on this, it turned out that generically they didn't learn about the coin. They learned about go all the way to the right. Okay. And so if you put the coin somewhere else, they would ignore it and they would go to the right. So they've failed to extrapolate the reasonable goals, uh, re what the re goals reasonably could be from the initial data. But we started with image classification just because it turned out to be easier, um, or it seemed to be an easier place to start. Okay, cool. With some potential commercial applications, which is relevant to the for-profit and getting these methods out into the world, angle of the company. Okay. Yeah, speaking of th things this might be related to, how much do you see concept extrapolation as related to this idea of like corrigibility where agents are supposed to like uh allow themselves to be amended if they like, you know, misgeneralize in new environments or if they, you know, do something it turns out the creator didn't actually want. Oh. I just understood uh one of Nate's points uh, because of your question. Oh, excellent. Okay. And or how or, or one of the potential confusions there. Um, I think it is both not related at all and very related. Okay. The relation is that I think the corrigibility itself is the extrapolation of the concept of the well-intentioned assistant. Hmm. That is the basic concept that we have examples of for humans and that we are trying to push to um, superhuman, well, to the superhuman AI level. So if you have a good model of concept extrapolation, then this al would allow you to push corrigibility itself upwards. But corrigibility, I don't tend to think of the agents 
as corrigible that as in they they extend their world model and then they change their preferences to according to say human feedback it seems a lot more that or it it is a lot more that they have a process for how their values should be extended with as their environment changes but this is compatible with bayesianism hmm. as in this is compatible with once you've done once you've gone to the end of the process say once you've know everything there is to know about the universe or every possible universe you can then work backwards from the your value system to what information about the world tells you about that value system so like when is human feedback reliable that is very easy to do if you have a the real in quotes human uh, value function then human feedback is reliable exactly when it points towards the real human value function and is unreliable when it points away from it okay but you don't want to have that way of thinking from the beginning, but you want to be compatible with that, as in you want to behave in a way that is compatible with a Bayesian agent gaining information. Okay. Because if you're not, you, well, it breaks. There's a lot of theorems on this. This is where things go badly. And I feel that corrigibility, in many ways, how it's conceived, is a way to try and avoid the Bayesian full expected utility maximizer approach. You're changing the utility function, you're rooting tearing out the previous one and replacing it with a new one that is more adapted to the situation. Mm. And the most approaches, including uh, mine that I've done with various indifference methods, mm. are trying to... They're in, intrinsically non-Bayesian, whereas concept extrapolation in general is trying to extend it in a way that could be Bayesian in retrospect. Okay. So this is a very convoluted way of saying that I see corrigibility itself as the extrapolation of a specific concept, mm. but that I see the approach of corrigibility as quite different to what concept extrapolation itself is. Okay. Corrigibility seems to be change utilities and avoid the badness that comes from doing this. Mm. That typically comes from doing this. Okay. Though I'm pretty sure that the people who are looking at corrigibility at the advanced level are thinking in a lot more of a Bayesian way. But I think most people's conception of what corrigibility is is different from what value extrapolation is. All right. Well, like, it seems like the thing you're saying is, like, uh, corrigibility is, like, an extrapolated version of the concept of, like, deference. But also, like, a lot of corrigibility approaches involve, like, you know, you're ripping out some preferences and installing a new one, whereas you think of concept extrapolation as more like, oh, you're updating something in a way that, like, could be rationalized, you know, in some formalism as Bayesian updating, but, like, you don't necessarily already have the prior or whatever installed. That's what, that's what I got from your answer. Okay, that is about a tenth of the length of my answer and much better. Okay. <laughs> but yeah. Yep. Basically that. Yeah. The next thing I want to ask is 
is there anything that you wish uh, I or other people would ask you about concept extrapolation and your work on it that I have not yet asked? Let's think. The main thing that I think I would like people to get is that a lot of things that people seem to think about concept extrapolation are wrong. So the best questions would be, do you believe blah, or does concept extrapolation do blah? To which I could say, no, not at all. Um, I can try a few of those questions. OK. Um, I, I have a few. Yeah, well, wh why don't you? Yeah, so let's. OK. Yeah, here, here's one that I have. So the world has a lot of like clocks in it, right? So for instance, like the Bitcoin blockchain just keeps on getting longer. And like every day it's longer, or on the vast, vast majority of days, it's longer than it's ever been. And if you know that, like there might be some worry that like concepts are just always going to be splintering because like for any... Um, concept you ever see, like you could imagine extrapolating it the quote unquote normal way when the Bitcoin blockchain is one block longer, or, you know, flipping it when the blockchain is one block longer. Uh, does this mean that like model splintering is just always constantly happening? Uh, yes, model splintering is constantly happening. And the space of potential concept extrapolations is always huge and growing, hmm. the space of useful and acceptable ones is not. And what I, yes, yeah, so I'm not trying to get every possible extrapolation of human values that could ever exist. Hmm. We are trying to get the ones that, well, not the ones, we get some in the family of adequate and survivable ones from the human perspective. Okay. I, I'm wondering if the Bitcoin blockchain example poses some sort of like, or, or some sort of impossibility result, right? Because like there's a whole bunch of way, different ways concepts could extrapolate when you add this new feature mm -hmm. and like adding like, new features to the world or like stuff you haven't previously heard of can make things like either it can be totally irrelevant as in the Bitcoin blockchain case, or it can be extremely relevant. Like, uh, you know, we like turned the consciousness off on everyone <laughs> or something. And so I'm wondering if that poses some sort of impossibility result where like, well, you know, when you add a new feature, things can either like basically not have important differences or have extremely important differences. Part of the difficulty is that human judgment is very clear as to what is irrelevant and what isn't irrelevant here. Hmm. So the examples you've given me, obviously one is a lot more relevant than the other, but we're using our human judgment for that. Yeah. One thing that you can do is take some diminishing return mix of the possible extrapolations. Um, generally, this will turn out to be quite acceptable according to most human uh, evaluations. No one really knows what the exact balance between liberty and uh, absence of pain uh, is uh, across the cosmos, but we have the the range. Oh, I have to be careful here because I'm talking about the range of the possible trade off between the two, which there is a vast amount of different trade offs you can do, which result in very good worlds. But people tend to think of pushing on the, okay, ignore that 
physics is maybe a good example, not necessarily the laws of physics, but all the atoms in this room kind of physics. Uh, you could say I add more atoms, the entropy goes up, the combinatorics explodes, mm -hmm. but we can deal with that. So we can simplify or we can take statistical combinations of uh, different approaches. And the being conservative and combining the different values or preferences or possible preferences in a conservative way, take a log of them and sum them, for hmm. example. These these tend to work at least roughly, and so the no, I don't see the combinatorial explosion of possible concepts as providing all that much of a problem. We can cope with this in the physical world, and there's no reason that we can't cope with it in the moral world. Okay. So yeah, in the case of like conservatively combining different extrapolations of values, um, it seems like an issue is, so take the Bitcoin blockchain example, and let's say there's, you know, some value, suppose it's something very simple, like the balance in my bank account, I want it to be high. It seems like you could have diametrically opposed different extrapolations, where one extrapolation is, I always want it to be high. And another is, well, I want it to be high until the blockchain is a certain length, and then I actually want it to be low. And then once the blockchain is that length, like you can't really conservatively combine those two, um, those two different extrapolations, because there's, there's like nothing they agree on <laughs> is good, right? One's just like a sign flipped version of the other in this yes. new domain. And it seems like unless you restrict what sorts of extrapolations you're allowed to throw into the conservative combination, you're going to potentially run into these issues where you can't like neatly trade things off in the way you'd want to. Mm -hmm. I want to specify first that conservative combination is more a placeholder than a full method. Yeah. I'm not saying that this would always work. I'm using it as an example that can be built on. Hmm. The other the other argument is if your true preferences are to have the Bitcoin to this point and then it be as low, this should leave some traces in your in your preferences, uh, in your behavior, in your what's the 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 conservative combination and other more Bayesian hmm. approaches doesn't really work with values that are strictly antagonistic. Yeah. Which is why, say, S risk utility functions are particularly bad. What are, what are uh, S risk utility functions? Uh, suffering risk utility functions. If there's a utility function that values uh, extreme suffering in a positive way, it mm. is very difficult to combine that with one that wants human flourishing and human happiness. Whereas if you had a paper clipper utility function, that is easy to combine with one that wants flourishing. You get a you get more human flourishing and you get more paper clips. Everybody wins. But when okay. they're antagonistic uh, like that, it is very difficult. But if they are antagonistic in terms of values, this is where is the evidence for the um, l let's take the you want the Bitcoin to be your Bitcoin to go up until a certain date and then afterwards to go down. Hmm. Where is the evidence for that? If nothing changes apart from the date, yeah. if you have not gone around saying, oh, I want to cash out at this date, or actually Bitcoin is evil, I want to destroy all my value, or 
if there or it's is just not... my bank account uh, or or your your yeah, bank it, account or it doesn't but yeah if there is literally nothing changed hmm. or if there is literally nothing that seems relevant changed then i say basically ignore the Gru and Bleen type examples, i.e. the ones that go in a, a concept extends and then for some inexplicable reason it flips. Okay. In the same way that we do that with uh, in, uh, in with uh, empirical problems. If, however, there are hints pointing that this might that this might flip there, then we have evidence for it, then that's a different situation. But in most cases of extrapolation, it is a question of trading off various possible values or extrapolations rather than a question of dealing with maybe it's the exact opposite of what the evidence has suggested so far. Okay. So, so this would say something like, look, if you can like value the same features in the same way, even when like there's a new feature by default, unless there's some indication that like you shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's, I guess like oh, there yeah. was um there's an example I believe from Eliezer a few years back about diamonds. If you want more diamonds, how do you define this across all the the future? Hmm. The how you extrapolate the concept of diamonds is there are many different ways of doing it, but the basic idea is that if you go back to the environment on which people collected diamonds initially, the values there or the preferences there should be uh, should be clear. And if there's no sudden flipping at that point, there's no reason to have a sudden flipping of the extrapolation further on. Okay. I guess, so the next question I have about the like blockchain length versus consciousness on or off examples is it seems like, um, yeah, the difference between those things is that one of those features is incredibly important to humans and the other, another is not. And therefore like, you know, you should like behave differently with respect to the change in blockchain length compared to how you would deal with oh. consciousness turning off. Yes, sorry. Um, oh. I Feel free to share the insight. I, I forgot that we don't actually, we, we have different um, audios. Yes, okay. If we are thinking of concept extrapolation, a lot of what you're saying makes sense. Hmm. We are thinking mostly of value extrapolation. Are those the not particular... the same thing? It's value extrapolation is a subset. Okay. The value extrapolation is when you are aiming to extrapolate the concepts on which your values or your reward functions or your preferences are based. Okay. So it means that we don't care about the extrapolation of the concept of blockchain because no one cares or very few people care intrinsically about blockchains. Hmm. So we don't but, have to extrapolate every single concept. We only are extrapolating things of which human values are closely related to. Okay, but but I mean, you have to you still have to extrapolate like um, you know how to deal with my bank account balance when the when the blockchain gets longer, right? Um, that seems like it's mostly an empirical question. I just need to figure out what you want from your uh, bank account balance, or more precisely, what you want from your ability to access that. What, what is the values that drive you to have a certain bank, uh, bank account? And if I can figure those out, uh, then the connection between the bank account and the blockchain and all that is just hmm. empirical. I guess it's you might think that it's not totally empirical. Uh, so partially because you don't know how those values that relate to how I deal with the bank account, you know, change with a longer blockchain, 
And also, I can't like simulate an environment where the Bitcoin blockchain is longer because it requires solving difficult computational problems. Uh, yeah. So I can't like give examples of what the world would be like if the blockchain were longer to you. At least not fully fleshed out ones. Not fully fleshed out ones, but I mean, you have used this description and I understand it perfectly. Well, or I understand it. Hmm. It's, I don't see what the blockchain is doing here. We can replace the blockchain with, say, any chaotic process uh, or any complicated process, uh, pretty much. Yeah. It's what, uh, what, what the algorithm is fundamentally trying to extrapolate is your values yep. and your preferences. And there does not seem to be much evidence that human preferences are tied to complicated objects like the blockchain and that maybe if they are like maybe it's some noise in the neurons is relevant to whether we swerve left or right on a particular moral point mm. then treating it as noise or as stochastic seems to be sufficient yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that human values actually depend on the length of the blockchain. I'm just using that as an example of something that's like, you know, you're regularly reaching values that you've never seen before. And like, if you couldn't handle extrapolating across that, things would be quite bad. And there's one correct extrapolation. There's one correct extrapolation. Yep. The correct extrapolation is I don't actually care. Like, if I wanted my bank account balance to go up before the blockchain was so long, I oh. still want it to go up. Yes, but I think there's a there are too many th things that are entangled in that um, analogy. What's uh for the... for the record, my actual bank account balance is with uh, a normal U.S. dollar bank. <laughs> I um, and could you give us the account number and uh, maybe a sample of your signature and your mother's maiden name maybe. in this podcast? Maybe in the the bit after the recording, perhaps. <laughs> but the the Bitcoin basically goes through a hash function, and the content of the hash also depends on people's a lot of decisions across the world i'm not if you say that your behavior depends on the length of the blockchain or on a particular feature of the blockchain you have defined a relatively simple function defining your preferences i'm I'm not saying that i i know i'm th this is not a this is not something where i have a particular answer that i'm working towards this is where i'm sort of thinking aloud on yeah uh, well, what what you were saying so for any preference or, or or for any like type of behavior if you let it branch off the length of the blockchain like you can make it more complicated by you know doing some complicated thing before it was so long, and then doing some different complicated thing after it was so long, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it can. But there are first of all, you have a complexity cost, but I'm not counting on complexity costs to be the things that save us. Hmm. But there is, but what I am counting more on is the fact that any most reasonable accounts of human values, uh, both empirically and theoretically, do not have those kind of features. If you, yes, if you told me that this is what future Stuart would do and that there was no particular reason for this, I would say, okay, this is a failure. 
Um, so it's, but I could imagine a world in which our preferences were more often structured like that. It just seems that it isn't the world that we live in. So part of the analysis of human preferences and meta preferences and getting that information into the extrapolation process would rule out those kind of examples. Yeah, I'm asking how would they rule them out? By the... Okay, this goes back to my, what is it, uh, version 0.9 uh, defining human preferences or... Um, what, 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 do you remember what the name of that thing was? No. I remember the version 0.9. But research agenda. Ah, yes, preference research agenda. Synthesizing a human's preferences. Hmm. Now, we have the fact that human's preferences do not, in anyone's judgments, behave like that. How does this fact get inserted into the preferences, into the extrapolation process? Hmm. Uh, well, typically, there's two ways you could imagine it going. The first one is the explicit way that all human meta preferences are included in this uh, extrapolation process, mm. and therefore that rules it out directly. But it's not so much that it rules it out; is that the human meta preferences point towards how preferences are supposed to behave, yep. and this thing is not compatible with uh, the directions that they're pointing in, but. The other way is the human programmer's decisions on what on part of the thing that they define inside their function. Like a lot of you can rule out a lot of clickbait by saying, okay, if it's a listicle, it's likely to be a, a clickbait. That's a mm -hmm. feature. But you're actually making a value judgment on that. You're making the value judgment that the sort of things that are listicles are clickbait. And the reason there's a value is because clickbait is intrinsically a value definition. It is things that attract people's attention. That's a behavior. But that it is not good for them that, the, uh, that the, uh, their attention is attracted. That's a preference. Mm. But people do things like, if it's a list, it's more likely to be clickbait without realizing the values that they are injecting into the process. So I expect that some of the choices made when saying this is how you extrapolate may encode a lot of human knowledge about our preferences without necessarily necessarily realizing it okay but but if we're talking about i don't know either concept or value extrapolation mm -hmm. I, I guess in my head i'm imagining like we're building some ai system it like has acts you know it gets to look at like the whole world or at least mm -hmm. it's, it has the ability to infer a whole bunch of stuff about mm -hmm. the world so i wouldn't have thought that just have this ensure that this thing doesn't have access to this random feature that like the Bitcoin blockchain length that you know you don't care about preference-wise, it doesn't seem like... I, I would have thought that wouldn't be an option. Um, I think you may have misunderstood what I was saying. Yeah, I understood you to be saying something like, you know, if we don't want this thing... Like, like if there's some distractor feature, like blockchain length, that you don't want to you don't want to cause splintering, then just like build your system so that that's not one of the features. Um, yes, but this is more, this is at the meta level that the, like a property, if I was to say that a property of extrapolations of human values is that they don't suddenly flip to their opposites for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. 
what I was just saying is that ideally, this would be a meta preference that was okay. Let uh, let me. This is something that I've thought about, but not formulated extremely clearly. Um, take. I am hoping that there is a syntactic definition of wire heading. Okay. That you can define wire heading um, in a way that does not require looking into values much. Okay. That the concept of capturing the measurement of your own reward, so affecting a, si a simple part of the universe to... Uh, whereas the actual reward function affects a much larger part of the universe, that this can be defined in a syntactic way, mm. i.e. there might be a formula uh, for it. I give it, say, 40% odds that there's a formula that defines wire heading sufficiently clearly that we can set it aside. It would be lovely if that was the case. Mm. If I do stumble upon this formula, I'm going to add it to the definition of value extrapolation. Now, because wire heading is something we don't want, mm. I have used my own value judgment to add a syntactic piece of the definition of the process that makes it more value aligned with human preferences in uh, in general. This does not, this is a way that our values can be implicitly encoded. I, I mean, it would be explicitly because I'd say that this was that, but if this is the case, this implicit encoding of the values is not inferior to another approach which is say more value extrapolation or concept extrapolation on the example of wire heading it would be equally valid or more valid if we if it worked hmm. so if i get something add something along the lines by hand of don't assume that the values randomly uh, flick uh, reverse for no reason, then whether this works or not is something we can test and we can compare it with other uh, our, our other values or outcomes in various situations. But But how do you... Go on. But but how do you operationalize that? Like if I'm writing, if I'm writing my AI that gets to you know walk around in the world, like how do you write code that says you know you're allowed to think that values depend on some things but not on the length of the Bitcoin blockchain? I mean, you're allowed to think. It's allowed to think anything. Yeah, it's allowed to think stuff. But I'm but if I'm programming it, how do I like? I mean the the most obvious way of extrapolating it would be some energy style where you have a variety of different criteria like simplicity, like not randomly reversing itself, like compatibility with a whole load of estimated extrapolated meta preferences and that you would do an energy minimization uh, on that. Okay, but, but when you say not randomly reversing itself, what do you, what do you mean by that um, in, in terms of operationalizable concepts? Um, operationalizable concepts. I mean, choose the... If... Okay, so if you just take all of the extrapolations, say complexity weighted, hmm. and became conservative across them, 
you would tend to get rid of most of these cases because there would be for the one that starts carrying the opposite of the blockchain there's the one that starts carrying twice as strongly for example okay and there is no particular reason to prefer one over the other so a lot of these are just going to get cancelled out by that aspect of it by by because you're averaging them or yes because you're averaging them or even with a logarithm and uh, normalization is but just i mean the we sort of do that in this movement here may have caused a disastrous tsunami in three years time for for listeners reference stuart just uh waved his arm while holding a mug or it may have prevented it hmm. the um we don't consider all these options mainly because there's no reason to think that it goes one way or the other yeah. and when doing extrapolations similarly if there is this odd behavior i put quote odd in quotes but it's actually it is odd mm. a, a lot of the odd behaviors or the pathological behaviors can be defined as yes it might go this way but it might go completely the opposite way as well whereas yeah. the, the so if i'm th- it continues along in a more comparable there's so if, if we went back to the model that i was discussing before with the the different features and the probability distributions and you looked specifically at a reward function or candidate reward functions hmm. you could port those back and forth between say your simplistic model and your uh, more sophisticated model and there you can start having them pay a complexity cost or a in in a way that is pretty close to the way that you can do it for physics okay so just in terms of this averaging out thing why would that not mean like say we're wondering how much i value like human happiness and flourishing in a world where like you know tomorrow versus today well one way to extrapolate it would be i value it the same way tomorrow is today one way to extrapolate it would be well i value it the opposite tomorrow is today there's like a minus sign flip and therefore if you average it those out like you know i stop valuing things at all i'm like totally neutral about things right because that's the average of like plus x and minus x is zero basically uh um, if if there's some averaging out why does it not average out to zero i mean because especially if you have more than one day if you have always valued human life roughly the same yep then i would argue that the departure of suddenly you don't value human life or suddenly you value human life twice as much are equally valid uh, extensions uh, at that point and those okay. are the ones that tend to cancel out but but how does that um i agree those are equally valid and unlikely i'm wondering how does that get modeled like how does that show up without someone just saying well those are two equally valid extrapolations um, I mean, th- th- this again seems to be exactly analogous to the problem of empiricism in um, problem of Im- sorry the problem of induction in empirical situations. Yeah. Uh, so for the for the problem of induction, you can have a prior. I didn't have. Yeah. So so I guess maybe what we're doing is we're having some kind of prior over potential concepts. 
So the, there, there's two places that I would appeal to to get that prior. The first is complexity, which hmm. helps here. Uh, though, as I say, I don't want to rely too much on complexity. Yeah. The second is human. Well, okay. But then there's a stronger version of complexity, which is all the different pieces of human values, none of them really exhibit this kind of behavior. So it would be even more surprising if just this aspect did. Exhibit what behavior? The um, suddenly inverting itself for no reason. Though... Well, because the blockchain got longer, not for no reason. Um, but... And the, but uh, the... And the 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 other thing is the human um, meta preferences, where we like if we if we had a discussion about what we value, then and uh, and you would ask people, would they uh, would they prefer to suddenly um, completely value the opposite when the blockchain gets longer, for example. Hmm. People would tend to say no. Now, I know that you can't go from empirical observations to values. I <laughs> I wrote a paper on that. But hmm. um, given some um, assumptions about how human statements connect with human values, yep. uh, which is and from which you build the rest. Then this is this then becomes evidence that we don't want our preferences to exhibit this kind of behavior. So this is a value related reason for the extrapolation of these lower level values to not exhibit that behavior. All right. Um, so I guess we could talk about that much longer, but our time is limited. Earlier, you said there were things like basically misunderstandings that people had that you wanted to clear up. Are there any more of those that you'd like to talk about? Yes. Part of it is that a lot of people seem to think that we're relying on human feedback to get um, to solve the ambiguity between different possible extrapolations. Okay. It's a method we use now with much dumber AIs. Than, than humans, but this is ultimately not going to work. There are a variety of things that can be done. One is to generalize human feedback in an idealized way, uh, it, so itself a form of extrapolation. You can become conservative. There are various ways for choosing to extend your uh, how you extend the the concept or the reward, and we're going to be analyzing them. But sort of mm. ask the human is more of a practical stopgap for current systems. It's not a big aim of mm. uh, the approach. And in fact, in a sense, we feel that the biggest challenge or the most, the big, one of the bigger challenges here is not choosing the right extrapolation, but having the right extrapolation as a candidate. Hmm. So just to go back to the early example, if we have an AI that is hesitating between do we want videos of happy humans or do we want actual happy humans, if we've got to that, well, then fantastic. Either we can let it become conservative between the two or we can tell it that it's the second or most of the battle is already won at that point, mm. which is why so much of our early focus is getting the extrapolations or getting the good extrapolations rather than choosing amongst them. Yeah. Although even in that case, it seems like you have to filter out the crazy extrapolations. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. We, we, th th this is a simplified mm. outcome with just those two. but. It does sort of, yeah. So a lot of people are focusing on how do you choose from amongst these extrapolations. The 
in practice in a lot of um, ML machine learning stuff, they don't generate any candidates except for one. Our ensemble methods generate a few mm. more. Bayesian methods generate a huge amount, but um, they sort of already have a prior ahead of time, which is a bit of a cheat in this case. But yes, let's start by getting some reasonable candidates before we worry too much about the process of selecting amongst them. And ask a human is just the current sort of stop gap uh, for the current practical problems. Okay. So that's one misunderstanding people have. They think that you're trying to, that you're focusing on choosing between extrapolations. Yes. The other one is that we think that we can build up from solving image classification to solving AI alignment. Okay. In a sense, it is the opposite. We have seen the advanced form of value extrapolation, concept extrapolation, as the way that we plan to solve AI alignment. And we're using image classification as a toy version of this to understand how this approach works. What are the features? What is the theory that we should be building here? And so it's not so much a question of building down, building up as applying the ideas to the simplest the simplest non-trivial problem that we can apply it to. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess there the the worry would be, I, I think if I inhabit that critique or that misunderstanding, I would think like, well, okay, you're trying it on this really simple example, and then you know, you're learning some things and like making some tweaks. Well, maybe like, you know, when if you're trying to align some like crazy AGI, uh, that will also have some like new tweaks or you know new things to learn that weren't already contained in the image classification case. Oh, I I see the the point. Yes, it's not. Yes, it's definitely not taking the learning approach that we have on image classification is not mm. the approach of how you would align a dangerous superintelligence. Okay. It's we can tweak and we can experiment and we can play around with it precisely because it's not an AGI that we're dealing with. This is, in a sense, practical theory building, if that makes uh, if that makes sense. Sure. The if we have a system to deploy on an AGI of great power, then it would not be because, oh, well, it works with images, so it'll probably work with this AGI. Mm. It would be because our work with images and other things have led to the development of a theoretical framework that we think is sufficiently solid that it can work with an AGI. Okay. So, so the idea is like... Uh... You know, you have some sort of proto theory. You play with image classifiers. You come up with like a theory. You like think about, okay, is this theory solid? Do I think this theory covers like what it has to cover? And like then you use it on AGI. Mm -hmm. And uh, toy examples have been very useful in both philosophy and in physics in the past. Relativity came from ideas of. Um, what if you were on a cannonball that was falling through the earth and that kind of... Mm. And yeah, you can get a lot from uh, toy examples when it comes to building theory. In fact, a lot of the examples and counterexamples in alignment at the moment are essentially toy examples. Mm. Okay. So I guess my final question is, if people are interested in following your work and, you know, more stuff about concept extrapolation or whatever else you might work on, uh, how should they do so? The two easiest ways are to go to our website, uh, buildaline.ai, and sign up for um, a periodic newsletter, or look at Less Wrong or the Alignment Forum to see some of the things that we post there. Currently, there's also a benchmark and a challenge, which is 
can you disambiguate features better than uh, what we've done? And if you can, I would love you. And please uh, send me, uh, please get in contact about that. Okay. And how can people find you on Less Wrong or the Alignment Forum? Stuart Armstrong is the username. Okay. Great. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me here. It's It's been interesting, and I think I have developed some of the ideas in the course of this conversation. Excellent. To the listeners, I hope uh, it was interesting for you also. This episode is edited by Jack Garrett, and Amber Dawn Ace helped with transcription. The opening and closing themes are also by Jack Garrett. The financial costs of making this episode are covered by a grant from the Long-Term Future Fund. To read a transcript of this episode, or to learn how to support the podcast, you can visit axrp.net. Finally, if you have any feedback about this podcast, you can email me at feedback at axrp.net. 